So we've got 25 meters left in the ship move, probably 40 left in Argus. So that we'll just wait for them to come upstairs. We'll still be moving along and they can move on from there. Two corals here. I want to thank Todd for your kind comments. He wrote, do you ever stop and think about what you're doing? It's truly astonishing. 2,300 meters down, exploring a 100 plus million year old seamount and broadcasting it live globally. <laughs> Thanking, mm. Thank you to every member on board the Nautilus to make this happen. Every single person is crucial to the success. And I share your sentiment, Todd. This has been a life changing event for me to be part of this crew for these two weeks. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Yeah, it's been an awesome watch. Lovely people. Oh, here. I can fix that. Okay. Lateral little faster. No, I'm going to go full speed. <laughs> full lateral speed. Full lateral speed. Let's see how fast that is. <laughs> yeah. Chonikov seems to be beating us. Yeah, nice. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to see. I like how the last dive of the season for us, we get the awesome Chonoclops view as our last creature. Yep. <laughs> totally fitting. Very awesome. All right, ROV switching over. Okay, we're going to be going through, a, going through a ship change. This one might be a little quiet for a few minutes while the next crew takes over. Thank you so much, viewers, for joining us.
All right, how are we doing up there, everyone? Doing well. Okay. Hello. Uh, Steve, the handover I was given in terms of waypoints was just heading straight up to waypoint 10. Is that what you still envision, or is there any other kind of method or route you want to take? Yeah, no, we want to keep it moving Cool. Um, in that direction. Or that have, have we been stepping at point 2 still, or point 3? I'm still at point 2. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. I'll go ahead and do... Keep with that 30 meters and do a 100 meter step. Great. Bridge, Nav. Can we move 100 meters at 030? Zero, zero? Thank you. It looks like it gets quite steep very soon, huh? Um, yeah, so the contours here, it's kind of a uh, unfortunate mapping circumstance. Oh, um, is it our, too Yeah, but it's two high. different layers because we have background data from a variety of different sources. Okay. Um, that's the... Uh, so I wouldn't expect steepness, but we should be on the lookout for it. Okay. Sounds great. Monster truck courses. Yes, exactly. Can we zoom on the cup coral coming up here? Um, can you right circle it for me? The, um, whoop. Oh, yeah, I see it. <laughs> Thank you. And maybe do like a pirouette around yes. it, I think is what. Yes, that, that's Oh, exactly. is that what that arrow was? <laughs> yeah. You, you could do zoom. a whole swirl. <laughs> <laughs> whole yeah. dance routine to it. <laughs> or a football play? Not clear to me. Right there. Look yeah, at that. right there. That one. All right, nice. It's really difficult to tell these apart, but I've seen a number of these and I've sampled a number of these and uh, this kind of long uh, pedestal flared calyx usually indicates the genus Javania. There are many species, but that would be my best guess for this one. Great. Javania is also one of the deepest um, cup corals. We collected one a few a bit deeper. In fact, a couple of them. Oh, I have to clear the screen on this one. It won't go away. Oh, yeah, and then um, a black coral here. Oh, yeah. Also, Very that's a uh, heteropathies. You can push in further for uh, the black coral? Zoom. Okay. Great. That's great. Okay. I was just going to ask how that sea anemone fared, but then I realized we're still on that same dive. <laughs> <laughs> the one that we started the dive yeah. with, yeah. Maybe that's a good segue into introduction. <laughs> 12 to 4 watch is back for our daytime watch. Uh, so we can go around and introduce ourselves. My name is Kelly Farron. I'm sitting in the science communication seat. I'm going to pass it over to Steve, our watch lead. Hey everyone, Steve Oskovich. I'm the watch lead and science manager. I'm also a deep water ecologist, uh, focusing on deep water corals, their diversity and biogeography. Um, next to me, I have in the data logger seat. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ashley Mickens. I am a master's student at the University of Victoria in British Columbia. And on board, I'm the ocean science intern and data logger. Wanna do front row, starting with video. This is Steve in the video chair. Hey, this is uh, Josh Chernov. I'm sitting in the Argus seat. I'm the ROV operations manager for OET. Uh, Gabby, her seat. And my name is Kate, and I am sitting in the navigator seat today. Thanks, everyone. And for those of us who may just be joining us, we are continuing to explore an unnamed seamount. This is Seamount B. Um, making our transect up, we started at around 3,700 meters in depth, and we're making our way up to about 1,900 meters. It 
It's nice to see some more rocky terrain. I feel like we had so much sediment on our last watch. Maybe we'll get more corals. Maybe. <laughs> I'm very curious to see. So several of the past dives over the past two expeditions, the depths of 1,800 to 2,000 meters seem to be like the threshold for explosions of life. And as long as the <laughs> as long as the um, the terrain is suitable, I think we can probably put some money on that. A coral explosion. Yeah. Yes. An explosion of life. That sounds great. Um, do we have a off bottom time here, or an on deck time? No. Uh, we. Two B D U two C. Okay. So we'll see you at midnight. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, the, the plan sign. is we're gonna try to reach the the peak within six hours. Okay. Go for zoom. It's weird at this point. Like I feel like kind of like un like unanchored if I don't have the lasers. I'm like, oh, that's where the middle of my screen is. Like, I place things right below the lasers. If I don't have the lasers, I notice. Two bamboo corals on branch, both. Go wide. Fish. Hey, buddy. Okay, have at it. Ooh, fish and sea cucumber. Oh, boy. <laughs> I wonder where he's coming from. The second time on this dive, we've seen those sea cucumbers like floating up above. A sea floor. Oh, and a sea star back there, too. Oh, look. Explosions of life. <laughs> They're coming.
Kate, you were saying something about, oh, finish your, I'll ask you when you're done with your calculations. <laughs> Ashley, did we collect anything interesting on the watches before us? Any fun biological samples or anything? Um, there are a couple new ones. I think we have a crab. Mm. That's exciting. Um, and a few zoanthids. Yeah. Another pink sea star. Nice. Working sample. Yeah, so that'll be fun. No other carnivorous sponges. No, I think we got the, the best sample of yeah. the, the dive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm excited to see that thing or see how it fares, I guess. Come down a little bit. Coming down. Were you uh, zoomed in at all? I feel like. Um. Okay. Oh, I'm it just looked very a bit, close. Looked a bit up tighter than usual. Uh, it is a little bit tighter. Uh, usually I'd be about here, but I'm seeing a little bit of the suction mm. hose. Oh, yeah. So. Okay. Um, I don't know. Just Josh, if you want, you can move it. Or just tilt up a touch. Okay. If I want, I could just move it. I could just move the camera. I think that's fine there. It's way yeah, easier. I like, I like the tilt up a little bit. I can see okay. a little bit more into the distance. Sounds good. Very observant, Steve. <laughs> I, I, I That's a that hard thing to catch. People yeah. are very strongly opinionated about tilting, like level or tilting down. A lot of people, scientists, like tilting down to see the seafloor clear. Okay. I like to look outward so I know what's coming. Mm -hmm. so. Interesting. I'm with you, Steve. Even scientists have very opinionated ways of piloting, <laughs> and they're not afraid to tell you. <laughs> You haven't heard Go for before. Zoom. Black coral. Yeah, that's um, it's a black coral. It's probably heteropathies, um, and this morphotype we have been calling heteropathies americana. Okay, go on. It is, it is kind of one of the goals of piloting where you learn, you know, through the watches what your watch lead or lead scientist wants to kind of see and then always try to adjust the piloting style to meet those needs because that's really what it's all about. Okay, go wide. Is it awesome, Steve? Thank you for reading my mind there. That was great. Uh, what do you mean by come up? We 
we can still we can still stay on the bottom at one knot. Yeah. All right. Let's we just, might fly we just, a little bit higher. Yeah, up, maybe a little higher. We won't be able to stop or sample, so yep. we just have to like drive. Yeah. If that's. Uh, I'm gonna get in, out in front. If that's if we're gonna start that now. Yeah. If that works for Steve. Yeah, yeah. We want to make way. Um, yeah, we have a kilometer to track, uh, so we want to try and get to at least waypoint eleven. We'll evaluate time when we get there or close to that. Okay. And see if we need to go a little bit further at, at a faster rate of speed. But how long did you say it would take from base base eleven to thirteen? Okay. Yeah. Okay, in that case, we may want to um, hit that target uh, slope a little bit closer to waypoint 11. So, you know, uh, basically continue our, you know, one knot transit a little bit closer towards waypoint 11. Okay. That might affect how you want to drive across the bottom. Uh, we may want to slow down a little bit depending on actually how steep that is. Yeah. Um, so I'd say, yeah, we go a knot to waypoint 11, and then we may just want to back off the speed a bit, uh, maybe to half a knot just to, just to assess how actually steep that is. Um, and then if it's not as vertical as it might be, then we could go a little faster. And then if it's, it's, if, if it's one of those like steep walls, then we'll definitely have to slow down. Yeah, maybe slow down to half a knot at that point, and then and then we'll see see what we see. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Uh, what's the bearing that we're going to be moving at? Sorry, say again. Zero three eight. Okay. Roger. Uh, can you come around to? Yep. Zero four zero. I'll, I'll come around once we start okay. going, or Argus starts to swing. So Steve, I'm going to start out as close as I can be to the bottom, but I suspect we're going to end up like up here-ish as we start to really move. That's fine. The goal is to move. Um, okay, not yeah, to see the bottom. We're not going to plan on doing any sampling or okay. zooms. Yeah. Great. I'll just stay as close as I can. The rest will be gravy. And if he wants to change his heading too, that's fine. I mean, if he wants to come around. I'll let him know. All right, that move is in. Bridge, nav. Uh, as we make this transit, if you need to change your heading to be in the same direction as the bearing, uh, go ahead.
So for our viewers watching, we're going to speed up a little bit here and make our way up the slope of this Seamount B um, so that we can get to the summit a little more quickly. And then we'll have a bit more time to explore that area that we're definitely excited to see. There's a bit more biological life up there. So we won't have true blue water for the next bit, but we won't be zooming our sampling as much. So if you have questions, send them in. I know, Steve, you've been preparing a, a silica lecture. <laughs> I don't know when you'd like to give that. But I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, At some point, I, wa I want to hear that. Uh, yeah, I, I was debating whether or not sleep or prepare my silica lecture would be more important. Oh, <laughs> I hope you chose sleep. <laughs> We have a viewer who's been watching the oxygen concentration data and seeing that that has been changing. Um, what might be the cause of that change as we're exploring? Yeah, so let me see where oxygen is at right now. We're looking at about 74 micromolar, so pretty low um, O2 concentrations at the moment. 94, sorry. Uh, 94 micromolar, uh, which is a minimum for this dive so far. Looking at the entire profile on our descent gives us a better picture of where we are relative to the oxygen minimum. The oxygen minimum here is around 600 meters, where O2 concentrations drop to 47 micromolar. So that's, that's pretty low. Um, it's, it's not low enough to be traditionally defined as an OMZ, oxygen minimum zone. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks like 30 might be the, the lowest O2. It's still um, it's still an area of low oxygen. Um, but typically, the, the cutoff we use for persistent OMZs kind of love along the eastern margins of a lot of um, ocean basins are typically around 20. The um, setting's coming around slowly. Still, it's pretty stressful. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Concentrations for animals. Didn't see him put in the move. Well, we started the dive Good. yeah closer to the seafloor. Uh, yeah. In the range of 130, 140 micromolar. So we've gone down a, quite a bit, um, but it doesn't mean that oxygen concentrations are necessarily stressful here. It seems like there is an abundance of life, um, or there are organisms that are used to living down here at these lower oxygen concentrations. But remember, it's uh, it's extremely cold down here too, so that kind of reduces some of the metabolic need for higher oxygen concentrations. So things can kind of eke out an existence using the lower concentration of, of oxygen they have here, combined with the fast currents that move around, usually delivers plenty of oxygen to um, things that may exchange gases across their tissues, like corals and sponges, uh, and then if you notice, a lot of the fish down here aren't very active kind of predators uh, like you might find in the surface ocean. Uh, a lot of them are, are pretty sedentary. Um, they might move a little bit to station keep, like the cuskiels, um, but they're fairly efficient at how they use that oxygen resource. I hadn't really thought about that with the currents. You know, I th think about it bringing the food and nutrients to these corals and different animals, but that it's circulating that oxygen, even if it's a low oxygen level. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting oxygen is is very difficult to live without, um, you know, unless you're a microbe uh, or you have special adaptations um, to you know, persist through areas of times of low oxygen. Like uh, some bivalves can can undergo um, a process of fermentation and get energy uh, with it without the presence of oxygen. Um, it's pretty stressful on all organisms, but if you do have plenty of um, freshly oxygenated water being delivered uh, in a unit of time, you can usually um, exchange that gas within your tissues, keep things moving. But there, there are some really interesting areas of the world, like I was mentioning before about the oxygen minimum zones. 
where you can have persistent areas of low oxygen, you know, sub 20 micromolar. Uh, and those are quite stressful. And it's a noticeable difference when you go through one of those OMZs. Um, I did some work in the Costa Rican oxygen minimum zone a few years ago. And uh, we found that as you go through the oxygen minimum zone from shallow to deeper, there's a whole scale turnover of species. There are no species that have depth distributions within or through that OMZ. It's either the assemblage above, the assemblage within, or the assemblage below. Uh, huh. They're very isolated, so it's a very hard boundary for organisms to pass through. It's interesting. Yeah, we might call it a, a filter um, in ecology terms. But there are, like I mentioned, there are some corals in the assemblage that live with live within the depths of the OMZ. Um, and a few of them, um, we were able to match up their occurrence with oxygen concentrations from our sensors. And we found that a few of them live at you know, sub 10, sub 5 micromolar concentrations. Uh, these, of course, are instantaneous values. The one thing that we hypothesize is that there might be sort of periodic differences in oxygen um, through, uh, you know, perhaps daily or even seasonal timescales that might allow these organisms to get just enough oxygen to persist through. Uh, or there might be things like internal um, waves or tides that uh, bathe these corals in higher oxygenated water for periods of time, but also then in lower oxygenated waters um, as the wave passes through. It's not really well understood and it would be really great to do some, um, put some landers down in these OMZ coral communities to try and track what the conditions they're actually experiencing are. It's interesting because I don't think much about like, or I don't hear as much about daily or seasonal variation in the deep sea, especially when we're talking about temperature, it stays quite constant, which is so different than when we're thinking about surface waters, which Obviously, daily, diurnal, and seasonal variations of almost everything. Um, so I hadn't heard that before, that it can, like, reach, like, waves could reach down here and impact it yeah. on that scale. That's it, it's pretty crazy. <laughs> it, it is yeah. true. Um, so the, the depth of the OMZ that I'm talking about is a bit shallower, so that's the seasonal impact is probably a little bit more pronounced um, than kind of the abyssal or, or hadal zone. But... Um, yeah, so with uh, in the Eastern Pacific, you have very strong uh, decadal uh, or annual oscillations uh, like El Nino mm -hmm. that can change the oceanographic patterns in that part of the ocean and result in changes of upwelling and, and how uh, oxygenated waters are ventilated. So all of those things, you know, it's in these really complex, oceanographically complex environments, are, are things we need to get good constraints on, good handles on, before we can make conclusions about, you know, if these are just you know, oxygen minimum zone specialists or if they are just, you know, managing. Mm. Just getting by. <laughs> just getting by. <laughs> So Steve, a question for you about some of these fish we see down here. Do they use bugle pumping? Uh, not, not as much as you might see in an oxygen minimum zone. So this is the process by which uh, fish might be observed to be uh, breathing, quote unquote, breathing um, more intensely by pumping, the opening and closing their gill plates and gulping water and sending water through their gills to oxygenate their tissues. Um, not so much down here. I wouldn't say that oxygen concentrations are all that low. These are still kind of 
well oxygenated waters by oceanographic standards um, compared to the surface ocean maybe not so much but remember um, you know in this at these depths you're talking about water masses that are quite old and they haven't been recently ventilated um, if you're familiar with the process of thermohaline circulation you know that water is downwelled in certain parts of the ocean and it stays deep for quite a while as it moves throughout the ocean basins and then it's upwelled in certain other places uh, so a lot of this water down here has just not necessarily been ventilated uh, in a long time and the consumption of oxygen results in depressed oxygen values but they're not really all that low um, so yeah generally not not observed at these depths but it is something that you could see in an OMZ or in a midwater environment um, where you have fish for example that are living um, you know floating in the midwater trying to oxygenate their tissues you also see a lot of times adaptations of fishes and other invertebrates towards living in low oxygen concentrations in that they will uh, kind of go into a, a hibernation like state and just kind of get curled up and not move huh. um, trying to preserve you know not trying to use as much energy um, and use up as much oxygen because the omz's are actually really interesting ecological um, habitats because things like large predators right if they use it if they have a lot of you know musculature that has a high oxygen demand may not necessarily be able to live and hunt and forage and, and prey upon things within the omz because they just don't have the uh, oxygen to do it but it could be a refuge for smaller animals um, that may want to hide from those predators and that's kind of the yeah, that's kind of the idea behind uh, dial migrations. Yeah, I love thinking about the energy management aspect of these extreme environments. It's so different than living on a ship where we get fed all the time. <laughs> Are they still moving at one knot now with the heading change? I forgot, I have a, I have a Grafana for that now. It's not showing up yet though. I have a question from a viewer wondering about the verb for operating an ROV, which typically you say flying an ROV, but I don't know, Gabby, Josh, do you guys have other verbs you like to use as you <laughs> <laughs> fly these around? Oh, it took me a second to like figure out what they were asking. I was like, <laughs> yeah, we definitely use the word piloting uh, or operating. Flying. <laughs> so I feel like, I mean, it's not totally ROV specific, but we've assigned a lot of different verbs to how we explore on this watch. I think we had reverse, was it reverse slaloming last night? <laughs> yes. Was anyone impressed? <laughs> yeah. Have we shown anyone those photos? I haven't yet. I've I need to print them out and tape them everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the screenshot I got of your solemn. <laughs> Normally I'm known for taking screenshots of shame when I don't like what people do, but this is the <laughs> opposite. <laughs> Ooh. 
Yeah. Not gonna distract the pilot right now. <laughs> I, I was I was just gonna place that there. The chocolate nodules can wait. Yeah, it's for a little bit. Might pick up some more of those on my way home. Delicious. They're so good. So tasty. That's better, yep. I feel like, okay, this might be a little off topic, but I feel like I could one day, if this whole science thing doesn't work out, open up an ocean-themed chocolate shop. That sounds fabulous. I yeah. support you, Steve. I will very much support you. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah. If I'm going to make macadamia nodules, my, uh, <laughs> my centerpiece item. Maybe it's with some more truffle-y flavors in there. I feel like the, the caramel-y macadamia nut things are turtles, yep. typically. Those are going to be amalgamations. Mm. I already thought of a name for them. Jump on SPL. I can hear Okay. Geology names for all the treats. Is that what you guys have been discussing while I was getting well, distracted and getting behind? Steve has another career aspiration. <laughs> which is, besides Chocolate. catching all of the anemones? Chocolatier, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yes. You must have had sea foam, right? What? Sea foam. Uh, that's, that's the stuff you put in your gas tank? <laughs> on a boat? <laughs> <laughs> it's like an oh. aerated toffee covered in chocolate. Okay. Oh, whoa. Have you ever had that before? I have not. No, no. I haven't. Is that a Canadian I, thing? <laughs> I might Maybe. be. Canadians yeah. have Nanaimo bars, and I swear they're geniuses. Oh, those things are so good. They are delicious. Yeah. You have to, we need an ocean theme for that. Oh, okay. Yeah, what's up with the, the rhesus situation in Canada? That's different, too. What is the rhesus situation the in Canada? The peanut butter cups come in larger packages. There's like more numbers of cups per three, package. Three of them, yeah. Yeah. You get three? Three. Yeah. What? Same uh. price? I haven't encountered <laughs> I don't know what the price <laughs> <laughs> It's like we compare prices of gas, too. Oh, <laughs> we talk about ketchup chips while we're on the subject? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> They're not bad, but not as good as All Dressed. What's All Dressed? Better. Everything. So like now, a, now, like now, you're, now you're like way ahead in your pulling. Right? That's, I know, that's why I'm, I know. That's why I'm bouncing. That's why so I'm bouncing, got, too. You got to find that medium zone and then s keep your speed consistent. Okay. This is all dive-relevant conversation because our watch name is Vancouver Island, right? Well, no, no. Uh, our I thought we changed that. We yeah. changed it so that you would feel oh, more included. Okay. I, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, now I can't stop thinking about different chocolate treats, though, for things we've seen on this dive. Because we've seen those like pillowy rocks, which if you had like marshmallow in your chocolate, that'd be good. I would call them alterations. alterations. <laughs> marshmallow covered chocolate, maybe some graham crackers. Ooh, yeah. Bits of cherry for oxidation patches. So how do we sabotage your science career? Yes, yeah, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Probably get me to talk about silica. <laughs> okay. Oh, it's getting murky here, hey? Look at this, it's getting... 
It's currenty and murky. Yeah, so current, it, it looks like it's coming through this. Uh, oh, that was strong button. Um, I wonder if this is current coming through the. My microphone is on. Hold on. Yeah, I'm actually really fighting. Yeah, I was wondering if the microphone, uh, can you hear that? My yeah, echo? it sounds okay. like. I think I lost the control here. What's that you're hearing? Uh, my microphone came on and I can't figure out how to turn it off. Uh. Um, so I'm, I'm fighting some current right now. I might need to make a change if it doesn't let up. Oh, you're doing fine, Gab. Look at you. You're way out there. No, nope, but I mean you're you're pretty well ahead. You're. Um, I mean, sometimes I kind of judge it by the floats, right? The floats are the floats. They're they're all down, right? They're not creating a catenary. Am I like announcing with like a speaker or yeah, something? All right, how does it sound? Good, better. I was fast.
For those of you who may just be joining us, uh, we are continuing our fifth dive here, um, exploring an unnamed seamount, the Seamount B, um, where we started off at about 3,700 meters in depth and have been following uh, a transect upslope, looking for geological samples, biological samples, pretty similar to our earlier dives on this cruise. Right now we are speeding up a little bit um, just to make our way to the summit. So we're not exploring right on the seafloor as we have been. Um, so making our way up there so we can explore that area um, and hoping to find a little bit more biological life. So we will see. But feel free to type in your questions as we're moving our way up there. like a lot of nodules here. I haven't really seen a plane like this in a bit. So running, so we're now uh, we got three hours, ten minutes or so left on the bottom. Um, so I'm thinking, based on what we drew our calculations on for that um, transit between base waypoint 11 and the summit, I'm thinking if if it's safe, we should probably move a little bit more upslope as as um, as you feel it's safe enough to do. Okay. Before we drop back down and go back into exploration mode. All right, so pull up closer to the actual waypoint 11. Yeah. Is what I'm hearing. Yeah. All right. Um, also, just keeping an eye on the speed that the ship is making. And I guess they're at one knot, but previously they were about 0 0.7 knots. And they're using max thrusters, so um, not ma not quite making one knot the entire time. Can they cut in the aux auxiliary thruster? <laughs> Not quite installed yet. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> We're actually uh, not joking. <laughs> oh, really? Wow. We're trying to, I think this, we're trying to uh, incorporate the main engine into the DP system. If we need a little, uh, we need some more holding power hmm. in situations, then we could start the main engine and uh, have that be part of the DP system. Oh, that's really interesting. Cool. Um, yeah, so waypoint 11 is going to be another, let's see, 50, 100, 200, 250 meters shallower um, than when we launched off. Yeah. That, that seems to be about the right depth where we need to get our next rock sample. Okay. Um, so that would put some insurance in the bank. For uh, insurance time in the bank for looking around the summit and getting a good rock and the biology that might be up there. Maybe we could try maybe. 